我宣布。The 9,116th meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is the situation in the Middle East, including the Palestinian question. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's provisional rules of procedure, I invite the following briefers to participate in this meeting. Mr. Tor Winners Land, Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process. Mr. Philip Lazzarini, Commissioner General of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, and Mr. Daniel Levy, President of the U.S. Middle East Project. It's so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration. of item two of the agenda. I now give the floor to Mr. Tor Winnesland. President, my last briefing took place just after Israel and Palestinian Islamic Jihad independently declared a ceasefire following three days of military escalation. I'm pleased to update the Council that the ceasefire remains in effect and a fragile calm has been restored in Gaza. The areas in Kerem Sharon crossings have remained open since 8 August, allowing for the entry of essential goods and materials. The UN is working with the parties to ensure the delivery of urgent assistance to those who need it most. The ceasefire prevented the situation from escalating into a full-scale war, which would have had devastating consequences. It also allowed for the resumption of the measures implemented over the past year that have resulted in much needed economic relief to the people in Gaza. But the ceasefire is limited to ending immediate hostilities. The underlying drivers of the conflict are still unresolved. Violence has increased across much of the occupied West Bank. Israeli settlement activities continues along with demolitions and evictions. Fiscal and political challenges threaten the Palestinian Authority's effectiveness in delivering essential public services. The West Bank and Gaza remain politically divided. Palestinians in Gaza face the challenge of economic and movement restrictions linked with the Israeli closure regime, the nature of Hamas rule, and the ever-present threat of violence. Unless the fundamental issues are addressed, the cycle of acute crisis followed by short-term fixes will persist. Concerted efforts are needed to restore a political horizon and resume meaningful negotiations. Mr. President, my briefing on 8 August provided an initial account of the three-day escalation. Overall, the Israeli Defense Forces conducted some 147 airstrikes against what they said were militant targets in Gaza. Palestinian militants indiscriminately fired approximately 1,100 rockets from densely populated areas in the Strip towards Israel. Of these, Israeli officials reported that around 35% were intercepted by the Iron Dome and 18% fell short and landed within Gaza Strip, causing damage and reportedly civilian casualties. The violence took a severe toll on civilians. According to the most recent figures, 49 Palestinians were killed, of whom at least 26 were civilians, including four women and 17 children. According to the Ministry of Health in Gaza, 360 Palestinians were injured during the escalation. Israeli officials reported 70 Israeli injured, including nine children. In Gaza, 10 houses were completely destroyed, while another 48 were severely damaged. A reported 650 housing units were damaged. On 5 August, Israeli forces carried out a series of airstrikes, killing a senior PIJ leader and other suspected militants. In the initial strikes, a five-year-old girl was killed in eastern Gaza City, along with two men, and a 22-year-old woman was killed east of Khan Yunis. On 6 August, a 60-year-old woman was killed and five children injured in an Israeli airstrikes. One of the children, a 10-year-old girl, died in hospital on 8 August. On the same day, seven other Palestinians were killed in an Israeli airstrike in Rafah, 
including a 13-year-old child, two women, and a senior PID commander. 30 others were reportedly injured, including at least seven children and five women. On 7 August, five children were killed and four others were injured in an explosion in Al Fallujah Cemetery, east of Jabalia. On 16 August, media citing Israeli official sources reported that the IDF had concluded that the casualties were caused by Israeli airstrikes. The IDF has not publicly confirmed this finding. On two separate occasions, Palestinian civilians were killed and injured in explosions that the cause of which was, has yet to be verified. On 6 August, seven Palestinians, all civilians, including at least four children, were killed in an explosion near Emad Akil Musk in Jabalia. 43 others, including 26 children, were injured. On 7 August, an explosion in Al Buraj killed three children and their 49-year-old father, whom Al Qassam brigades claimed as an operative. Israeli forces denied involvement in the incidents, which they said were caused by rocket launched from militant groups. Palestinian armed groups have made no public statement on these incidents. I am concerned that airstrikes in densely populated areas resulted in civilian fatalities and injuries. Israel must abide by its obligation under international humanitarian law, including the proportion, proportional use of force and taking all feasible precautions to spare civilian and civilian objects in the conduct of military operations. I, I condemn the indiscriminate launching of rockets from Palestinian armed groups from highly populated neighborhoods in Gaza into civilian populated centers in Israel, which violates humanitarian, international humanitarian law. I reiterate that children <clears throat> must never be targeted of violence or put in harm's way. Mr. President, daily violence also continued at high levels across the occupied West Bank. In total, during the reporting period, 12 Palestinians, including four children, were killed by Israeli security forces during demonstrations, clashes, search and arrest operations, attacks and alleged attacks against the Israelis and other incidents, and 289 Palestinians, including three women and 83 children, were injured. Israeli settlers and other civilians perpetrated 39 attacks against Palestinians, resulting in eight injuries and no damage to Palestinian property. In all, 28 Israelis and other civilians, including at least four women and two children, and four Israeli security personnel were injured by Palestinians in clashes, shooting, stabbing and ramming attacks, the throwing of stones and Molotov cocktails and other incidents. In total, Palestinians perpetrated some 75 attacks against the Israeli civilians, out of which 57 were stone throwing, resulting in injuries and or damage to Israeli property. <clears throat> On the 22nd of July, Nasser al a Hamas-affiliated formal official, was shot multiple times and injured by two unknown assailants in Kafr Khalil village near Nablus. The Palestinian authorities ordered an investigation and on 26 July Palestinian security forces announced that they have arrested two Palestinian suspects. On 24 July, Israeli security forces shot and killed two Palestinians and injured six others in an exchange of fire during arrest operations in Nablus. On 26 July, Israeli forces shot an unarmed 59-year-old man with a mental disability at Uvara checkpoint, south of Nablus. The man died of his injury on 29 July. On 9 August, Israeli security forces shot and killed a 16-year-old Palestinian and injured five others during a clash in Hebron. Israeli officials said the Palestinians had thrown stones toward the Israeli forces who responded with live fire. On that same day, four Palestinians, including a 16-year-old, were killed and 76 Palestinians were injured with live ammunition during clashes that erupted following an ISF military operation in Nablus. Another 16-year-old Palestinian subsequently died from his injuries. 
On 14 August, a Palestinian opened fire at a group of Jewish worshippers in Jerusalem's old city. Eight civilians, including a pregnant woman, were injured too seriously. The assailant fled the scene, but later turned himself over to the police. On 15 August, ISAF shot and killed a Palestinian during a search operation and subsequent clashes in Kufr Aqab, north of Jerusalem. Israeli police stated that the man was shot while attempting to stab officers. The man's father, who was present during the operation, denied this. On 17 August, ISF shot and killed a Palestinian and injured five others during clashes in Nablus, which took place in the context of Palestinians throwing stones and reportedly fired towards buses transporting Israeli civilians to Joseph's tombs for religious worship. This in accordance with established procedures. On 19 August, an unarmed 58-year-old Palestinian man was shot and killed. A video appeared to show the man was a bystander returning from dawn prayer when an exchange of fire broke out. There are conflicting accounts to the source of the shot. Israeli authorities stated they are investigating the incident. Mr. President, set-related violence also continued during the reporting period. On 29 July, a 15-year-old Palestinian was shot during a confrontation between Palestinians and armed Israeli settlers, accompanied by Israeli security forces outside Mugadir village near Ramallah. The boy subsequently died. According to witnesses, he had thrown stones and was shot in the back while running away. It remains unclear whether Israeli settlers or security forces fired a shot. Two other Palestinians were injured with live ammunition. In three separate incidents, Israeli civilians attacked Palestinian farmers while they were working on the land using batons and metal bars and throwing stones, injuring five Palestinians, including an elderly man. I reiterate that perpetrators of all acts of violence must be held accountable and brought to justice. Security forces must only use lethal force when strictly unavoidable in order to protect life. Mr. President, turning to settlement-related developments, on 25 July, the Jerusalem District Planning Committee advanced plans for construction of 1,215 housing units in Lower Akfad site adjacent to Kibbutz Ramot Rachel and the Palestinian neighborhood of Umtuba. Some of the units are intended for constructions across the Green Line in occupied East Jerusalem. On 27 July, Israel's Supreme Court reversed its previous ruling, ordering the evacuation of settlers from the illegal outpost of Michpe Kramim near Ramallah. The court accepted the government's argument that the Palestinian land in the area had been allocated to settlers in good faith and that the principle of market regulation should be applied. Right groups expressed concerns that the ruling would pave the way for the retroactive legalization of other old posts under the Israeli law. On 28 July, Israeli settlers accompanied by Israeli security forces moved into an empty Palestinian house in the H2 area of Hebron city. <clears throat> I reiterate, that all settlements are illegal under international law and remain a substantial obstacle to peace. During the reporting period, the Israeli authorities demolished, seized, and forced owners to demolish 78 Palestinian-owned structures in Area C and 18 in East Jerusalem, displacing some 103 Palestinians, including 50 children. The demolitions were carried out due to the lack of Israeli-issued building permits, which are nearly impossible for Palestinians to obtain. On 25 July, ISF demolished two house, homes housing multiple families in Kuarabat, Bani Hassan village near Salfit in Area B. Family members of the residents were accused of having killed an Israeli settlement guard in April 2022. The demolition resulted in damage to three additional neighboring homes and displaced 18 people, including 10 children. 
three Palestinians were injured in related clashes with Israeli forces. <clears throat> On 8 August, ISF demolished two houses in Romana village near Janine in Area B. The houses belonged to family members of Palestinians indicted for killing three people in Israel in May. Thirteen people, including four children, were displaced. I call on Israeli authorities to end demolitions of Palestinian-owned property and the displacement and eviction of Palestinians and to approve additional plans that would enable Palestinians to build legally and address their development needs. <clears throat> I am concerned about the recent announcement by the Israeli Minister of Education that it had given instructions to halt the granting of permanent licenses to six Palestinian schools in occupied East Jerusalem due to what it said was incitement against Israel in school curriculum. If a solution is not found, more than 2,000 students will be impacted. On 17 August, the Israeli Defense Forces military commander rejected objections by five non-governmental organizations against their pros proscription as unlawful organizations from November 2021. The same day, Israeli Defense Minister announced that the terrorist designation of three of these organizations issued in October 2021 under the Israeli counter-terrorism law had been made permanent. Three other organizations have appealed their designation. <clears throat> On 18 August, Israeli forces ordered the closure of offices of seven organizations, including all six NGOs designated as terrorist organizations in November 2021, and searched their offices in Ramallah. Equipment was confiscated, in some cases destroyed, and confidential files were seized. <clears throat> Israeli authorities also summoned the directors of three of these organizations for questioning. I, re <clears throat> I reiterate the Secretary General's concern about the shrinking space for civil society in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory. Mr. President, in Gaza, despite the disruption caused by the escalation, some positive steps occurred during the reporting period. As of 1st of August, over 14,000 economic need permits have been issued, including more than 11,000 permits for workers from Gaza to enter Israel, and nearly 3,000 permits for traders and businessmen. Israel also extended social entitlement to workers from Gaza Strip. Going forward, I welcome a steady increase in issued permits. <clears throat> Since the resumption of the movement into Gaza and out of Gaza on 8 August, progress has been made to restore the incremental easing of access restrictions we have seen over the past year. Nevertheless, delays in importing essential goods and equipment is still continuing. The current humanitarian situation in Gaza remains deeply troubling. <clears throat> the escalation along with the closure of Israeli-operated crossing between the 2nd and 7th of August exacerbated ongoing hardship and resulted in new immediate needs. The UN has identified approximately US dollar 15 million in additional funding requirements to pro provide psychological support, shelter, livelihoods, cash assistance, and essential medical assistance and medicine. In addition, the humanitarian response across the occupied Palestinian territory continued to face chronic funding gaps. As of mid-2022, only 25% of the requirement of the humanitarian response plan has been met. Meanwhile, global price rise for key commodities have strained the resources of humanitarian partners and placed vulnerable families at risk of food insecurity. The World Food Program is in immediate need of US dollars 26.5 million to support vulnerable households in Gaza and the West Bank. <clears throat> if funding is not received, support to these families will stop in October. 
in a welcoming step towards facilitating imports to the occupied West Bank. We have Jordan. On August 1, the use of 40-foot containers was permitted for the first time for shipping goods via Albi Bridge. I'm hopeful that it will pave the way for addressing other significant obstacles to Palestinian trade. <clears throat> Mr. President, turning to the region, in the Golan, the ceasefire between Israel and Syria was generally maintained despite several violations of the 1974 agreement on disengagement of forces. It remains important that the parties respect their obligations under the term of the agreement and prevent risk of escalation. In Lebanon, lack of progress with reforms, deadlocking government formation and increasing strain on institutions, including Lebanese armed and security forces, continue to weigh heavily on state authority. Heightening tension persisted in the Unifil area of operation in South Lebanon. In recent months, at least four firing ranges unknown to Lebanese authorities have been observed in regular use south of the Litani River. This is a blatant violation of the Resolution 1701. <clears throat> the rising numbers of incidents affecting UNIFIL's freedom of movement is unacceptable. Access throughout its entire area of operation, including the full length of the Blue Line, is critical to mandate implementation. Regular and ongoing violation of Lebanese airspace by Israel also remains a concern and constitute violence of Resolution 1701. Mr. President, the measures taken by Israel towards easing conditions in Gaza since May 2021 escalation have improved the lives and livelihood of, livelihood of many Palestinians, and I'm encouraged that they are being restored following the most recent escalation. UN will continue engaging with the parties to expand on the progress made over the past year with the aim of solidifying the ceasefire and enabling further economic development. But the events of the past weeks have shown yet again, managing the conflict is no substitute for a real political progress. We must turn our attention once again to the broader strategy of ending the occupation and realizing a two-state solution in line with UN resolution, international law and previous agreements. Such a strategy will require significant steps from all sides. This must include the strengthening of the Palestinian Authority and its ability to engage with Israel on political, economic and security fronts, as well as working towards the return of a legitimate Palestinian government to Gaza. Crucially, we must work towards restoring a political horizon. As a first step, tension and violence across the OPT should be stopped or significantly reduced, especially in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. Unilateral steps that perpetuate negative trends need to stop. The space for Palestinian economic activity and further improvements to access and movement in Gaza and the West Bank should be expanded. At the same time, the Palestinian Authority, including its institutional capacity, needs to be strengthened. Given what I regularly report to this Council, the status quo is not a strategy nor a strategic option, not for positive change on the ground, nor for a restart of talks between the two sides. I urge the Israeli and Palestinian leadership, regional countries and the broader international community to take firm action to enable a meaningful return to negotiations. Thank you. I thank Mr. Wendisland for his briefing. I now give the floor to Mr. Filippi Lazzarini. Mr. President, distinguished member of the Security Council, allow me first to express my sincere appreciation for the opportunity offered by the presidency to address the Security Council. Since I last briefed this council in May last year, the situation of Palestinian refugees 
has further deteriorated. Over 80% of Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, Syria, and Gaza live below the poverty line. In Gaza, the escalation of violence earned this month was a stark reminder that war and violence can erupt any time in the absence of a genuine and comprehensive effort to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. 60 Palestinian refugees' families lost their homes, 17 children were killed, eight were students in UNRWA schools. Nearly half of UNRWA students suffer from trauma and need special assistance to cope with the repeated cycles of violence and the economic hardship that the family live in. In the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, political, economic, and security conditions are deteriorating as Palestinian refugees experience high levels of dispossession, violence, and insecurity. In Syria, after 11 years of conflict, the most destitute families are returning to live amid the rubble of their destroyed homes as they can no longer afford rent. Children who return to demolished camps such as Yarmouk or Ain El Tal walk near unexploded ordnance to take UNRWA buses to school. In Lebanon, the pressure on the agency to do more to address the impact of the economic and financial crisis on the Palestinian refugees community is becoming unbearable. Protests and acts of violence directed against UNRWA are, at times, forcing my colleagues to close our installation. Illegal emigration of Palestinian refugees is rising. In Jordan, the pandemic left deep scars on the labor market. Unemployment is soaring, particularly for females and young people. Child labor and early marriage are reportedly on the rise. Despite these challenging operating environments, UNRWA remains the lifeline for one of the most underprivileged and desperate communities in the region. Going to school, getting health services, or receiving a food parcel are, for many Palestinian refugees, the only sources of normality. They look to UNRWA for that normality. Excellencies. For over 70 years, UNRWA has been a source of opportunity and hope for a better future for generations of Palestinian refugees. With the support of member states, the agency has contributed to one of the most successful human development stories in the region. From educating over 2 million Palestinian refugee girls and boys to universal infant vaccination and reduced maternal mortality that exceeds global standard, there is a lot for us all to be proud of. During armed conflict, your support enabled UNRWA to provide shelter and protection and helped rebuild destroyed neighborhoods and communities. The psychosocial support that Palestinian refugees' children receive is key to their mental well-being and essential for their ability to learn. And the quality of the education which UNRWA students receive is praised by reputable validator such as the British Council, UNHCR, and the World Bank. On average, they outperform their peers by one year of learning. In Syria, nearly 95% of UNRWA students passed the national exams this year. Rama from Yarmouk refugee camp achieved the highest scores despite prolonged displacement and repeated power cuts. Success stories are everywhere. From Gaza with the first woman technician in renewable energy in Gaza, to Barra, who joined a medical research team in Spain that is making groundbreaking progress in the fight against pancreatic cancer. Today, children and young people must be able to perform and compete in an increasingly digitalized world. UNRWA is committed to giving Palestinian refugees that ability. Our information technology hub in Gaza serves the whole UN system and provides jobs to over 120 young women and men. 
We reached gender parity in our schools a long time ago, and we are the only public-like educational institution to have rolled out a comprehensive human rights curriculum in our 700 schools across the region. While we are acutely aware that we operate in a politically charged environment, we have made unparalleled investment in promoting UN values and UNESCO standards across our programs and through staff attitude. Mr. President, today our collective achievements are at risk. For the past decade, the chronic underfunding of our program budget has made it increasingly challenging for the agency to fulfill the mandate given by the General Assembly. Shifting geopolitical priorities, shifting regional dynamics, and the emergence of new humanitarian crises have deprioritized the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Coordinated campaigns to delegitimize UNRWA with a view to erode the rights of Palestinian refugees are increasing in frequency and in maliciousness. The agency also has also experienced more than once how a change in domestic politics can suspend support overnight. Consequently, and despite immense outreach efforts, funding has stagnated over the last decade, forcing us to operate with a shortfall of around 100 million US dollars year after year. Until last year, the funding gap was managed through cost control, austerity, and carry over of large liabilities from one year to the other. But today, we have no financial reserve. We have reached the limit of austerity, the limit of cost control measures. Today, UNRWA is facing an existential threat. What is at stake? Quality and principal education for over half a million girls and boys. Access to health care for around 2 million Palestinian refugees and a social safety net for around 400,000 of the poorest among the poor. Psychosocial support for hundreds of thousands of children. Job opportunities for the youth in Gaza and elsewhere. Emergency food and cash assistance for over 2 million Palestinian refugees across the region to meet the basic humanitarian needs. What is at stake is simply the sense of normality and hope that our services bring to Palestinian refugees. Excellencies, a major aspect of the role of UNRWA in regional stability stems precisely from the predictability of its high quality services. For Palestinian refugees, UNRWA remains the last standing pillar of the commitment of the international community to the right to a dignified life and the right to a just and lasting solution. When they see us delaying salaries, decreasing the quality of the services, and unable to respond to increasing needs, they understand that the support of the international community to the plight is fading. Despair and a sense of abandonment are growing in the refugee camps. Despair is a threat to mental well-being. Despair is a threat to peace and stability. Mr. President, it is hard to believe that the lack of sufficient resources results solely from financial constraints. The impact of predictable services on the safety of refugees and on regional stability should suffice to convince every member state to commit funding to UNRWA in line with the resolutions they adopt. Instead, the agency continues to be under three sources of intense pressure. First, the commitment of the General Assembly to uphold the rights of Palestinian refugees and its instruction to UNRWA to deliver a number of public-like services until a just and lasting solution. Second, the lack of sufficient funding from member states to implement the mandate 
and the unpredictability of most of the funding. And lastly, the objection to any perceived change in the way services are delivered, any such change is seen as an attempt to encroach on the right of the refugees. Hosts and refugees fear that it might lead to weakening UNRWA and, with time, dismantling it altogether. Failing to reconcile these demands will make the UN General Assembly mandate more and more impossible to implement. Our ability to fulfill the G8 mandate lies with member states of the United Nations and with their political will to fully fund our core, our core budget. I appeal today to member states who have reduced the funding to reconsider the impact of the decision on the region's stability. I appeal to those who have changed the political and foreign policy dynamic in the region to continue to be part of the success stories of UNRWA's education. In a few weeks, the extension of the UNRWA mandate will be put on the General Assembly for approval. I appeal to all members to mobilize politically and financially to support UNRWA and to continue working towards a political solution that will benefit the region and its people. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Mr. Lazzarini for his briefing. I now give the floor to Mr. Levy. I would like to thank the Council and the Chinese Presidency in particular for allowing me to share some thoughts with you today. The events of earlier this month, covered in detail by Special Envoy Venezland, are as concerning as they are predictable. To be very clear, Israelis deserve security, Palestinians deserve security. Excellencies, month in and month out, the Council meets to repeat its familiar condemnations, formulas and slogans. I want to use this opportunity to rethink and reappraise some assumptions and beliefs that may inadvertently contribute to the intractability of this conflict, to consider afresh reasons why <clears throat> it remains so prone to stalemate and human suffering. And I suggest to do this through five concepts that may assist us in such an endeavor. First, justice. The permanent dispossession and denial of the most basic rights and freedoms of the Palestinian people will never be a recipe for achieving sustainable security. This, the illegal blockade of Gaza and the unlawful occupation, represent forms of structural violence and collective punishment that we cannot ignore. While the need for a political horizon is acknowledged, the dimensions of that horizon seem to shrink and shrivel, becoming ever less ambitious. There can be no effective or prolonged approach to Gaza in isolation. It is part of the broader Israeli-Palestinian reality, whether in terms of security, the separation policy, or, clo or closure. And cl crucially, there is a need to respect international law across the board, whether in state responses to armed threats or partisan resistance against state occupation. I would also say in this context that there is a need for Palestinian political renewal, internal reconciliation and overcoming of divisions, as well as an international need to engage all relevant actors without applying unrealistic and selective preconditions. Second, equilibrium. Any attempt to resume negotiations between the parties without addressing power asymmetries is a hollow and redundant exercise. As Comfortero, president of the crisis group with whom my organization, US MEP, cooperates extensively, as Comfort noted to this council recently, the structural power imbalance between an occupying state and an occupied people must be acknowledged. A focus on relations of power rather than both sidesism may help offer clarity of thinking and policy. As an example, attempts at economic confidence building are consistently too little, too late, and too ephemeral 
when they are attempted under conditions of permanent occupation. This defies principles of harmony and reciprocity. And especially with global resources stretched thin, the Palestinian economic predicament should really be understood as one that is primarily a function of politically imposed obstacles on movement, borders, access to land, confiscation, demolitions, ever-expanding settlements, rather than the absence of charity. We've heard the briefing of UNRWA C.G. Lazzarini just now. There must be that economic commitment to a predictably resourced UNRWA capable of delivering services. And that's a security necessity, but it's also a commitment of a political nature to Palestinian refugees who continue pe to be denied a solution. Third, accountability. I've previously had the opportunity to highlight to this council two core problems, a legitimacy deficit in Palestinian politics and an accountability deficit vis-a-vis -vis Israeli policies. It is Israel's actions as the powerful occupying party that preeminently determine the direction of travel. I would suggest profound shifts are occurring as a result of the unwillingness to hold Israel to account, not least on settlements. Recent months have witnessed a disturbing intensification of this trend with the targeting of those least able to protect themselves and those most in the front line bearing witness to violations of international law. Following the shock expressed by the Secretary General over the number of Palestinian children killed and maimed by Israeli forces last year, we've just seen that same trend again this month in Gaza, as noted by Envoy Venezland and C.G. Lazzarini. We witnessed the killing of those who report on and expose these crimes, Shireen Abu Akla being the latest journalist to pay with her life. And now I would draw your attention to the assault on those who document abuses and defend human rights, with Israel's actions against six prominent Palestinian civil society organizations, some funded by members in this room. A terrorist designation was made by the Israeli authorities against six NGOs. A number of countries went on record that compelling evidence had not been forthcoming. Now these offices of these organizations have been raided and shuttered and their workers interrogated. A response limited to expressions of condemnation is too easily dismissed. It's impunity on steroids and unfortunately it encourages more of the same or even worse. There really should be practical consequences at a multilateral and bilateral level. We already have a hollowed out Palestinian polity and economy and this is now an attempt to emaciate Palestinian civil society. Fourth context. It's no exaggeration to characterize the current global disorder as a world in metamorphosis, dangerously combustible while potentially rewarding if we can be innovative while realistic. In this respect, the Abraham Accords may be many things but they cannot be a substitute or distraction from securing peace and the rights of Palestinians. And if not properly managed, normalization can risk further nurturing a misplaced Israeli sense that the Palestinians can be ignored and marginalized. It's also the case that international law and principles purported to be universal cannot be asserted only when it is convenient and then set aside when friends or allies appear in the role of perpetrator. Our world is too transparent. These things are noticed. Fifth and finally, architecture. I would suggest that contrary to the prevailing perception that everything is stuck and it's a stalemate, in actual fact, Israelis and Palestinians are passing through a quite profound transition. Talk of the eclipse of the two-state option is neither alarmist nor far-fetched. Rather, it's a sober and it's probably a behind-the-curve rendering of the lived reality. 
I would say that for Israel itself, the absence of an off-ramp on this journey towards a new paradigm should be a cause for concern, placing in jeopardy that country's future. Neither Palestinians nor Israelis will disappear, and finding a just way to live together has never been more urgent. This profound shift will likely, over time, take every state represented here out of their comfort zone. Let me close by briefly explaining why. <clears throat> we know of certain developments that can at the same time be both politically uncomfortable but also politically salient. The increasingly weighty body of scholarly, legal, and public opinion that has designated Israel to be perpetrating apartheid in the territories under its control is just such a development. A designation made by Palestinian scholars and institutes, later examined and endorsed by Israeli human rights organizations led by B'Tselem, has now become the legal designation made by Human Rights Watch and this year by Amnesty International. This is what a failure to generate accountability and to achieve two states looks like. As uncomfortable as I know it is for some, I urge this chamber not to underestimate the longer term significance and traction of what is happening. At the Human Rights Council meetings in Geneva this March, states speaking on behalf of the Africa Group, the Arab Group, and the OIC Group all referenced this apartheid situation. And it will come as little surprise if this echoes and resonates in parts of the world that have experienced apartheid and settler colonialism and that have gone through decolonization. It is a paradigm that will also bring the discrimination faced by Palestinians as citizens of Israel into sharper relief. It must be a wake-up call. 75 years ago, this United Nations offered partition as the political paradigm for the Holy Land. Today, that land is de facto united under one dominion. Absent unprecedentedly far-reaching action to make good on partition, your successors in this chamber will come to debate the challenge of achieving equality under a reality of non-partition. Mr. President, if the council seriously considers these five principles and their implications, we may find a way out of the repetitive impasse, the familiar condemnations, formula and slogans, and perhaps usher in a new opening and path to justice and equilibrium for Palestinians and Israelis. I thank your excellencies. I thank Mr. Levy for your briefing just now. Many of your views are thought provoking and conducive to better reflection and solution of the issue by the Council. I now give the floor to the members of the Security Council. I first give the floor to the representative of the United States. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Special Coordinator Winsland and Commissioner General Lazzarini for your briefings. We also appreciate the briefing by Mr. Levy. We welcome the continued maintenance of the ceasefire enacted on August 7th, as well as the resumption of fuel shipments to Gaza to ensure that hospitals and other public services can maintain critical operations. The United States wants to reiterate its appreciation to Egypt, Qatar, Jordan, and the UN for their close engagement with all parties to prevent another escalation of this conflict. We mourn the loss of life and support timely and thorough investigation into reports of civilian casualties. We demand terrorist organizations, including Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, cease attacks on Israel. These indiscriminate attacks are on Israeli civilians 
recklessly put Palestinian lives in Gaza at risk. We condemn attacks on all civilians, including the August 14th shooting attack in Jerusalem on worshipers near the Wailing Wall. The United States values the role that independent NGOs play in monitoring human rights violations and abuses in the West Bank, in Gaza, in Israel, and elsewhere, and firmly believes they must be able to continue this important work. Respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms and a strong civil society are critically important to responsible, responsive, and democratic governance. The United States remains concerned about escalating tensions, especially in the West Bank. We urge Israelis and Palestinians to refrain from unilateral actions, including settlement activity, evictions, and the demolition of Palestinian homes, incitement to violence, and disruption of the historic status quo at holy sites, all of which risk the resumption of violence. Mr. President, as President Biden reaffirmed while visiting Israel and West Bank last month, the United States believes, and I quote, the Palestinian people deserve a state of their own that's independent, sovereign, viable, and contiguous. Two states for two peoples, both of whom have deep and ancient roots in this land, living side by side in peace and security both states fully respecting the equal rights of the other citizens, both peoples enjoying equal measure of freedom and dignity." Unquote. There are no shortcuts to statehood. It is imperative that all stakeholders help to develop the conditions for and embrace a political horizon that would support negotiations for a two-state solution, which can only be achieved through direct negotiations between the parties. The Negev Forum highlights what can be achieved by working together to overcome shared challenges in the region. We believe this forum can support the emergence of a more peaceful and prosperous Middle East. The United States also believes these efforts contribute to tangible progress towards the goal of advancing a negotiated peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Mr. President, the United States is committed to serving as a strong partner to UNRWA and is proud to be the agency's largest single donor. UNRWA plays an essential role, as we have just heard, in promoting regional stability, and it cannot do so without adequate funding. Many countries offer rhetorical support to UNRWA here in New York, but do not match their words with financial support. We encourage member states to provide robust, reliable funding to help address the agency's long-term sustainability, as the Director General has just outlined. In conclusion, Mr. President, we call on all countries to join us in our commitment to peace and security in the Middle East. We urge all parties to this Council and around the world to support efforts and initiatives that help meet the economic, political, and humanitarian needs of both Israelis and Palestinians. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the U.S. for the statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Russia. Thank you, President. We'd like to thank Special Coordinator Tor Venisland, uh, the Director of UNRWA, Philippe Lazzarini, for their briefings. And we're also very interested to listen to the briefing from Mr. Daniel Levy. Today's discussion of the situation in the Middle East comes three weeks after the escalation in Palestinian-Israel clashes, which became an armed confrontation with casualties. Another uptick in tension was provoked by Israeli Air Force strikes on a Gaza Strip, in response to which firing began onto Israeli territory. It's very disheartening that this is far from the first outbreak of violence. In this connection, we welcome the ceasefire agreement and we call on all involved parties to exercise restraint and avoid taking unilateral steps and engaging in provocational rhetoric, as, as well, and they should comply with international humanitarian law and not allow a new escalation of hostilities. We particularly note the mediation efforts made by Egypt and Qatar, which ultimately led to the ceasefire. We are concerned that this, if this 
if this type of scenario happens again, it would risk a full-scale military clash and a further deterioration of an already dire situation in the Gaza Strip. The people living there need immediate humanitarian assistance, including to rebuild destroyed infrastructure. President, it's becoming ever clearer that the Palestinian question has been unresolved for so long and without the required attention from the international community, any provocation could lead to far-reaching regional confrontation. The trigger for a resumption of violence could come from continuing unilateral steps, primarily from Israel, to create irreversible situations on the ground. The construction of, construction of settlements on occupied territories, the eviction of Palestinians and the destruction of their houses, property expropriation, arbitrary arrests, and a de facto carte blanche to Israeli military to use of force, to the use of force, the systematic violation of holy, the status of holy sites in Jerusalem. Over the last month, Israeli authorities have given preliminary approval to a plan to erect 1446 housing units in Sur Bahar in the south part of Jerusalem municipality. A decision was also taken to expand the Mevvohoron settlement to 251 housing units in the Ramallah province. The annual report of the Secretary General on children armed conflict expresses its concern about the number of Palestinian children killed by the Israeli army. In 2021 alone, 78 minors died and 982 were injured and 637 were arrested. Western countries de facto ignoring of the systematic violation of Palestinians' rights over the longest uh, occupation in post-war history, with excessive focus on separate regions and, and conflict situations, indicates a clear case of double standards. President, it has recently become clear that one of the factors which is hindering a just peace for Palestinians is the action of the United States, who are trying to monopolise the peace process and reformat it to fit their mould. There are obvious attempts to impose on Palestinians an economic peace rather than meeting their legitimate claims to create their own independent state. Washington de facto blocked the activity of the International Mediator Quartet. The last ministerial level meeting of this body was in 2016. On our side, we advocate for a just resolution to the Palestinian question based on a two-state formula and generally accepted international legal basis, which sets forth the creation of an independent Palestinian state within the 1967 borders, with eastern Jerusalem as its capital. Dur uh, direct negotiations between parties should also address other final status issues, including the problem of borders, refugees and water resources. Security concerns of Israel should also be taken into account. We take, are taking consistent steps to support collective efforts towards achieving pe towards peace in the Middle East. We are continuing our work with all interested parties in the region and at the Security Council. Thank you. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation and I'll give the floor to Representative Brazil. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> I'd like to thank Mr. Wensland and Ms. Lazzarini for their informative briefings. I also listened with great attention to the briefing by Mr. Levy. Mr. President, the ceasefire announced on August 7 is still fragile. Without concrete measures to reduce tensions in the Palestinian territories and in, and in Israel, there is a real risk of resumption of violence. Unfortunately, in the past days, we have witnessed actions with no aim other than shatter the current truce. I have in mind, the part in particular, the attack against Jewish worshippers in Jerusalem on August 14. I join Mr. Wensland in deploring the fact that certain groups justify such, act such acts of terror. Brazil is also concerned by the large number of Palestinian civilians that were killed or injured, in particular, the large number of children as a result of recent clashes. Brazil condemns all attacks against civilians and we call, all, and we call on all parties to exercise utmost restraint 
and abide by international humanitarian law. Mr. President, the cessation of acts of violence and terror, the escalation and rebuilding trust are all necessary and urgent, but they are not ends in themselves. Unless there is progress towards a just and sustainable political solution to the conflict, the danger of renewed cycles of violence will persist. Respect for international law and for the relevant resolutions of the Security Council must be the basis of any lasting peace. Brazil stands ready to contribute to find concrete solutions and ways forward. We reiterate our support for a two-state solution with Israeli and Palestinians living side by side in peace, security, and prosperity. As the conflict drags on, the civilian population pays a heavy toll, not only in terms of lives lost and people injured, but also in terms of frustrated expectations and dreams cut short. Economic growth and development are necessary to give the Palestinian people hope and to help reduce the appeal of violent ideologies. As we have stated before, financial support to the Palestinian Authority is an integral part of the efforts for peace and security. Moreover, the Palestinian economy as a whole needs support for its industrial and agricultural sectors. In this context, Brazil would like to praise the untiring work of UNRWA and of its Commissioner General, Mr. Lazzarini, for strive to fulfill their mission in spite of persistent underfunding. Even though our government budgets faces constraints of its own, Brazil announced in June an additional financial contribution to UNRWA, and we support the renewal of UNRWA's mandate at the next General Assembly. Mr. President, diplomacy and the efforts of the international community have prevented the most recent flare-up of violence from escalating further. Let us not be satisfied with a mere ceasefire. Instead, the Security Council should spare no effort to bring about real progress towards a political solution. The international community and the populations affected expected, expect no less from us. And I thank you. I thank the representative of Brazil. I now give the floor to the representative of Albania. Thank you, Mr. President. Every time we meet here on this issue, and this happens quite often, we express our serious concerns on the worrying trends of violence and tensions with the fear that such negative developments will take the Israelis and the Palestinians further away from efforts to resolve this tragic conflict. This is why upholding the ceasefire between Israel and the Palestinian militants is critical to avoid another explosion of violence and safeguard the gains that have been made through the tireless efforts of many actors over the last couple of years. This is especially true with regard to Gaza, where the ability of an increased number of Palestinians to work in Israel has a real positive impact on the population and contributes to improve the prospects of rapprochement and peaceful existence. Violence is a tragedy within a greater tragedy, which is and remains the unresolved Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Therefore, every effort must be made to prevent escalation and every opportunity must be seized to bring the parties closer together. Mr. President, we will not tire in reiterating our categorical rejection and condemnation of every terrorist attack against Israel or anywhere else. We abhor terrorism in all its forms and call on all to denounce it vigorously and unreservedly. We mourn every loss of life from such senseless and cowardly attacks, especially when they happen and involve civilians. We support Israel's right to defend itself and respond to ter terrorist attacks with proportionality and within the bounds of law, domestic and international. We are also concerned about the loss of life among Palestinians, especially children. Civilians in general and children in particular should never be a target or put in harm's way in any circumstance. 
these tragic cases should be properly investigated to deter similar cases and actions in the future. Each and every innocent victim of violence serves as a tragic reminder how desperately peace is needed now, not tomorrow. That this is why we support every effort to resume the peace talks within the legal framework created by the United Nations in order to find a lasting and just solution to the conflict with a democratic and secure Israel and with a viable and democratic Palestinian state living at peace with one another with Jerusalem as shared capital. Peace is always signed on papers, but it is actually implemented on the ground through concrete and resolute actions, palpable and beneficiary to all. There can be no doubt that peace will remain an elusive dream until Israelis and Palestinians enjoy full and equal rights, the basic condition for a dignified life. Rights are the foundation for reconciliation and mutual recognition between Israelis and Palestinians. Mr. President, let me also reiterate our strong support for civil society as a critical pillar of any democratic society. We join the European Union and others in expressing concern at the Israelis action against six Palestinian NGOs, as well as the calls on Israel to refrain from any action that would prevent these organizations from continuing their critical human rights, humanitarian and development work. We have said it so many times and deem it important to reiterate. Parties should refrain from actions that go against genuine efforts to promote the peace process. In this respect, we will continue to highlight our position that settlements and their expansion go against international law and constitute an obstacle to the two-state solution, the cornerstone of the peace process. They are wrong and must be stopped. We urge all sides to refrain from inflammatory rhetoric that escalate tensions and endanger the peace process. We see no other way than peace talks to reverse the worrying trend of escalation, escalating tensions and periodic and cyclic outbursts of violence. If there were one lesson learned from several decades of conflict, it is that violence has never been conducive to any positive development. To the contrary, it has always caused suffering, both among Israelis and Palestinians. The negotiation table is the only place where a viable and just solution lies and can be found. We support all efforts to bring the parties together, deal with the difficult and complex issues with patience and determination, we resolve and vision through dialogue and mutual recognition of each other's concerns and aspirations through understanding and respect. We should not, we should not let hope die since nothing good is ever done without hope and nothing important is ever built without dreams. I thank you. I thank the President's Representative of Albania. I now give the floor to the Representative of United Arab Emirates. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Wensland and Mr. Lazvini. Thank you all briefers for your briefings. We listened with great attention also to this statement by, by Mr. Levy. Developments in Gaza reflect a large number of significant events. The security situation is fragile and the cycle of violence is being repeated in a worrying fashion. These facts reaffirm that the only means to put an end to this cycle involve finding a fair, lasting and viable solution to the Palestinian cause. To find that solution, we must leave no stone unturned within the international community, and we must. We cannot simply manage the uh, events on the ground because that's not viable. Parties must resume negotiations to implement the two state solution and to create a viable Palestinian solution living within 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital. This must live side by side. Is Israel in peace and security with mutual recognition. The international community must also shoulder its responsibilities to safeguard peace and security by providing support to the political process. At the same time, we reiterate that it is vital to safeguard the ceasefire in Gaza. We hail the role played by Egypt as mediator to ensure de-escalation. The cycles of violence will not will only lead to more destruction. In accordance with the United 
According to the United Nations report, more than 80% of Gazan people rely on support provided to them. Youth unemployment is at 80%. At the same time, Gazan children are suffering from several problems. Namely, there are children that have reached 15, 15 years old and they've lived for conflict, lived in conflict for the majority of that time. There needs to be conflict resolution in Gaza, and that will have a positive impact for all, and it will make it possible to bring about stability. To bring about all of the above, we must step up efforts within the United Nations alongside partners to ensure the reconstruction of Gaza. The worsening of the humanitarian situation in the occupied Palestinian territory requires that efforts be made. Consequently, we call upon the Palestinian and the Israeli authorities to step up efforts in terms of service provision and health care provision to offer proper services, namely to refugees. We know that civil society stakeholders can play a very important role in Gaza. We note the recent but that recent developments are a source of concern. We must help NGOs to help the Palestinian people. Mr. President, we renew our condemnation of all unilateral measures which undermine the two-state solution, namely the settlement activities in Gaza. These undermine these council, this council's resolutions. We condemn settler violence against Palestinians. Measures must be taken to put an end to the above. We must also safeguard the status quo in Jerusalem, and we must and we must ensure that all measures are stopped which attempt to change the status of Jerusalem. To conclude, we reiterate our readiness to contribute to all efforts at an international level to strengthen the peace process and to implement the two-state solution. Diplo diplomacy and peaceful dialogue are the best way to ensure de-escalation because violence cannot serve anyone. On the contrary, victims are now in their thousands, namely women and children, despite the fact they deserve a better life. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, I thank the representative of the United Arab Emirates and now give the floor to the representative of France. Monsieur le Président, et je remercie. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Tar Wenisland and General Commissioner of UNRWA, Commissioner General for UNRWA. Thank you for your interventions. They were very comprehensive. I also welcome among us here today Mr. Daniel Levy. Mr. President, the immediate priority is to ensure that the ceasefire in Gaza holds, the uh, ensuring that the checkpoints of Eretz and Kerem Shalom remain open to goods and people is absolutely essential to respond to the most pressing needs of civilians. The consolidation of the truce must allow the resumption of reconstruction work that was impeded by the recent escalation. France is ready to fully contribute to these efforts. In this connection, we hail the work of UNRWA and particularly that of, UNRWA, uh, of the United Nations, in particular UNRWA. Their activity is vital for stability in the region. We encourage all donors to step up their financial support for the agency, as France has done by doubling its contribution since 2019, Mr. President. However, a, a, a new escalation is, however, inevitable if there is no paradigm shift and no resumption of a genuine political process. A strictly economic approach which does, does not restore a political horizon will not bring stability to the reason. For that reason, we must see an end to uh, unilateral measures, and that's indeed an imperative. Doing that involves an end to settlement activities, an end to demolitions, and an end to evictions. In this connection, France is concerned by the situation in Masafa Yata and Ain Samaya. We call upon Israel to abandon projects concerning the E1 zone. Parties must restrain from hate speech and incitement to violence. In this regard, France would like to state that in this connection, leaders of all stripes have a particular responsibility. We also call for the respect of the status quo of the holy sites. Like its European partners, France is deeply concerned by the European, the Israeli raids, rather, which have recently targeted the premises of several Palestinian NGOs. These actions against NGOs are unacceptable. A free and dynamic civil society is vital to promote democratic values and implement the two-state solution. 
For that reason, France will continue its cooperation with civil society in the Palestinian territories and will do so with these NGOs in the view of the absence of evidence demonstrating their support for or participation in terrorist activity. Mr. President, only the two-state solution will make a, make it possible to reach a fair and lasting peace. It's the only solution which we have to date which meets the legitimate aspirations of the Palestinian people and which makes it possible to guarantee Israel's security on which France will never compromise. France calls upon this council to work without further ado to restore a political horizon to put this solution into practice. Thank you. I thank the representative of France. I now give the floor to the representative of Kenya. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank uh, Special Coordinator Tor Wenesland for his briefing, particularly regarding the aftermath of the recent escalation of violence in Gaza. The briefings from the Commission General of UNRWA, Mr. Philippe Lazzarini and Mr. Daniel Levy, President of the U.S. Middle East Project, once again remind us that as long as the underlying political, social and development factors of this protracted conflict remain addressed, unaddressed, the cyclic trends including eruption and resurgence of conflict in Gaza, the West Bank and East Jerusalem will persist. We welcome the fact that the 8th of August ceasefire agreement in Gaza continues to hold. We commend all parties that have been instrumental in ensuring this, including the efforts of the neighboring countries. By the same token, we note that in already delicate economic conditions as depicted in Gaza, every escalation worsens the humanitarian situation, heightens existing tensions, and makes full recovery ever more elusive. As such, it is critical that this council strongly condemns terrorist attacks of groups such as Hamas, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and their affiliates. Mr. President, addressing the economic isolation of Gaza from the wider regional and global economy will be critical to the peace, security, and stability of the broader Middle East region. In this regard, the government of Israel's recent assessment and decision to increase the work permit quota for Palestinians in Gaza and to reopen the Erez and Kerem Shalom crossings is welcome. Such steps contribute to the implementation of Resolution 1860, which among other things emphasizes the safety and well-being of all civilians, as well as the need to ensure sustained and regular flow of goods and people through the Gaza crossings. Kenya reiterates that peace efforts both at the official and grassroots level, that comprehensively integrate the socioeconomic development of all sectors of society are and will also be critical to the stability and peace of the region in the interim and in the long term. In particular, a grassroots approach will continue to, harm, to harmon, harmonize coexistence and conducive conditions for official negotiations. As we have heard this morning, UNRWA continues to play a key role in facilitating critical health, education, social protection, microfinance, and other services to the Palestinian population. But we note that its fiscal situation remains dire. In this regard, and in addition to fulfilling pledges to ensure adequate and predictable funding for UNRWA, we urge strengthened efforts to identify areas of cooperation and co collaboration between UNRWA and other peace building and development entities. We believe that these, alongside confidence-building measures in the area of commerce and security between Israeli and Palestinian authorities, speak to what is immediately practical in the context of an elusive peace process. That said, these are not a substitute to the resumption of the political process and dialogue between both parties for long-term stability and peace. Our delegation underscores that the actualization of the long-held goal of a region where two democratic states, Israel and Palestine, live side by side in peace and within secure and recognized borders based on the 1967 lines will require meaningful commitment to the peace process by all parties in alignment with international law, the UN Charter, this council's resolutions, including the comprehensive pillars of Resolution 2334 and the existing regional peace initiatives and frameworks. Mr. President, a commitment to an independent, sovereign, viable, and contiguous Palestinian state 
also means the immediate and complete cessation of Israeli settlement activity in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem, as demanded by Resolution 2334. I thank you. I thank the representative of Kenya for the statement. And I'll give the floor to the representative of Gabon. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, President. I'd like to thank Special Coordinator to Wenisland and the Commissioner General of UNRWA, Philippe Lazzarini, for their briefings. I'd also like to welcome Mr. Daniel Levy, and we listened very carefully to his briefing this morning. Although the security, security situation on the ground remains very fragile, the briefings that we've just heard reveal some calm since our last meeting. Gabon reiterates its appeal to all parties to show restraint and to refrain from unilateral actions that could lead to a resumption of hostilities and hinder the peace process. Civil society activities who play a major role in the Palestinian territories and participate in the weaving of the social fabric as well as the promotion of human rights should not be hindered. It is essential for the people to be that NGOs are able to continue to freely do their work in difficult contexts. As we've just heard, the humanitarian and economic situations in the Palestinian territories remains critical. The, financial, um, the unprecedented financial crisis faced by the Palestinian Authority and the budget problems of UNRWA are only underscoring the urgency, urgency that the international community is uh, facing, but also underscores how useful NGOs are. We note with interest the decision of Israeli authorities to increase the number of Palestinian workers authorized to enter Israel. As a, we see this as a sign of detente. My, President, my country reaffirms its commitment to the two-state solution, living, two states living side by side on the basis of 1967 borders. We in, urge all parties to relaunch negotiations to find a resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian crisis for real and lasting peaks based on the respect of principles agreed by parties and the application of international law. The involvement of countries in the sub-region is crucial. The recent visit of President Mahmoud Abbas to Turkey following a resumption by these countries of diplomatic relations with Israel is a source of encouragement. The normalization of relations between Israel and Arab countries should contribute to the peace process in the Middle East and respond thus to the needs and legitimate needs and aspirations of Palestinian and Israeli people. To conclude, President, we reiterate our support to the mandate of the Special Coordinator and the work of UNRWA and we express our encouragement for their tireless efforts on the ground to find uh, to, to achieve stability in the region. Thank you very much. I thank the representative of Gabon for the statement. And I'll give the floor to the representative of Mexico. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. President. I thank Special Coordinator Wenesland, Commissioner General Lazzarini, uh, for their presentations. We also listened with great attention to the statement made by Mr. Levy. Today I will focus my statement on the following points. The situation in Gaza, the work of UNRWA, violence, settlements, and civil society organizations. As regards the situation in Gaza, we note that the ceasefire, which put an end to the violence unleashed at the beginning of the month, is holding. That violence claimed the lives of more than 40 persons, and the, th that number included 15 children. We call for a comprehensive investigation to be conducted, which clarifies who is responsible for these civilian deaths. We, are all, we also note the reopening of the border crossings and the increasing number of work permits granted to Palestinians. However, the situation on the Gaza Strip remains critical. We once again appeal for an end to the blockade. It is simply unacceptable that the children of Gaza, who account for 41 percent of the population no other no no other way of life than that under the blockade with no prospects for a political horizon designed to achieve a lasting peace cycles of violence will continue the work of UNRWA is essential as has been said in this chamber to meet humanitarian need 
conduct reconstruction work and to supply basic services to around 6 million Palestinian people. Unfortunately, the chronic financial deficit undermines the agency's ability to meet the aforementioned needs. Mexico takes note of the recent, inform, uh, the recent report rather, of the Commissioner General on the financial situation of UNRWA. We praise the steps taken to ensure the efficient use of resources, as well as efforts made to promote transparency and to diversify sources of financing. As a demonstration of our commitment since 2008, my country has made an annual contribution to UNRWA's budget. Mr. President, Mexico notes with deep regret the myriad instances of violence that have been recorded in recent days. We deplore the attack on Jerusalem's old city waged against Jewish worshippers and we condemn the fact that these acts have been exalted. We also express concern at the clashes following raids and operations conducted by Israeli law enforcement bodies in the West Bank. In only the, in the first seven months of the year alone, more than 45 lives have been lost as a result of lethal ammunition Palestinian lives, and almost 4,300 Palestinians have been injured, including 503 children. Mexico rejects the disproportionate use of force. Moreover, we condemn the shots fired at two ambulances run by the Palestinian Red Crescent, and we condemn the denial of access of three further ambulances. These acts are violations of international humanitarian law. Mr. President, Mexico deplores the decision to approve the construction of 1,400 additional residential units in the settlements of Harjoma and Givat Hamatos. The construction and expansion of settlements on Palestinian territory is contrary to international law and to the resolutions of this Council. At the same time, these acts undermine the viability of the two-state solution. My country takes note of the decision taken by some European nations to continue cooperating with six civil society organizations. In light of the lack of evidence of the, these organizations' ties with terrorism, because any designation as a terrorist entity, entity must be duly justified, we call for cessation to the harassment of these organizations, including for an end to the detention of personnel and the seizure of materials and equipment. A democratic state must not carry out actions which reduce civic space. Finally, Mexico reiterates its commitment to the two-state solution as the only viable alternative for a solution to the conflict. This is a solution, or and must be a solution, which meets the legitimate concerns, security concerns of Israel, and one which allows the consolidation of a Palestinian state which is sovereign and politically and economically viable in accordance with the relevant resolutions of this organization. Thank you very much. I thank the representative of Mexico for the statement. And I'll give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Thank you, President. And I join others in thanking Mr. Wenesland, Mr. Lazzarini, and Mr. Levy for their valuable briefings today. Let me start by welcoming the two-year anniversary of the Abraham Accords this month. The Abraham Accords are a historic milestone that bring us closer to the goal of shared prosperity and peace throughout the region. President, as we stated at the emergency session on the 8th of August, the UK welcomes the ceasefire in Gaza. We reiterate our calls for the parties to make every effort to sustain it. It is critical that humanitarian access in and out of Gaza is ensured in accordance with international humanitarian law. We were appalled by the terrorist attack in Jerusalem on the 13th of August. The UK unequivocally condemns and any and all acts of terrorism. Our thoughts are with the victims and families of those affected. We reiterate our unwavering commitment to Israel's security. This conflict has taken a terrible toll on both sides. We are concerned at the record number of Palestinians killed by Israeli security forces this year and urge Israel to show restraint in the use of live ammunition and to ensure a thorough and transparent investigation into all fatalities. President, we have been clear about our concern over the Israeli government's decision last year to designate six Palestinian NGOs as terrorist organizations. The subsequent raids on the offices of seven Palestinian NGOs, 
and arrests of their staff are equally concerning. Civil society organizations play an important role in upholding human rights and democracy, and they must be able to operate freely in the occupied Palestinian territories. We continue to engage with a number of these organizations. President, we call on the Israeli authorities to halt plans to advance evictions at the Khan al Amar and on the E1 settlement plan. Advancing E1 would seriously hinder a two-state solution. Settlements are contrary to international humanitarian law. This month, we also saw demolition orders issued at Masafer Yatta and against a donor-funded school in Ain Samia. Such demolitions cause unnecessary suffering and in all but exceptional circumstances are contrary to international law. President, the United Kingdom is a long-standing supporter of UNWA for the vital role they play in providing core services and humanitarian and protection assistance to Palestinian refugees across the region. We were pleased to announce at the pledging conference in June that we have agreed a new multi-year funding agreement with UNWA and will provide 15 million pounds this year. In conclusion, the situation on the ground dem demonstrates the urgent need to make progress towards a two-state solution that ensures a safe and secure Israel, living alongside a viable and sovereign Palestinian state based on 1967 lines, with Jerusalem, the shared capital of both states. The United Kingdom remains committed to working with all parties to reduce tensions and take steps towards a sustainable peace. Thank you. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom for the statement, and I'll give the floor to the representative of Ghana. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. President, I join previous speakers in thanking Special Coordinator Tall Venisland, Commissioner General Philip Lazzarini, and Mr. Daniel Levy for their comprehensive briefings, which give the Council an assessment of the prevailing situation on the ground. The briefings we have had today are not too different from those that the Council has previously had. It would have been our desire to hear a much more promising prospect of improvements on the ground for this decades-old conflict, which is not only a clash over territories, but also one of rights and aspirations for peaceful coexistence and development. Regrettably, from what we have heard, the parties are far from each other and the situation on the ground continues to impede the early realization of the two-state solution. Mr. President, we welcome, consistent with the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations, the reports of the renewal of friendly relations between Israel and Turkey, reflected in the decision to return ambassadors and consul generals to each other's capital. We hope that such efforts would help to strengthen regional stability and support the renewal of the dialogue required by the parties towards the achievement of the two-state solution. We co while conscious of the security concerns of Israel, we are nonetheless concerned about the worsening humanitarian situation, dire human security and incidents of human rights abuses, violations, detentions without charge or trial in parts of the occupied Palestinian territory, especially in the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. We are especially concerned by the killing and injury of several innocent and unarmed Palestinian, Palestinians, including children. We also share the international community's concern over the unilateral actions by Israeli settlers aimed at forcing Palestinian communities and families from their land across the occupied West Bank and in East Jerusalem. The raiding and shutting down of the offices of six prominent Palestinian civil society organizations, 
that are known to have contributed to human rights protection in the occupied Palestinian territories after their designation last year as terrorist groups is equally worrying. We do not condone terrorism in any form or manifestation, but we believe that such designations, if it is to be shared by international community, would require full justification. Mr. President, to achieve peace requires deliberate actions in building trust. In this regard, we urge the parties to de-escalate existing tensions and generate the needed political momentum for direct negotiations. We urge Israel to respect the inalienable rights of all those in the occupied territory and abide by its legal obligations and responsibilities under the fourth Geneva Convention relative to the protection of civilian persons in time of war. We reiterate that all parties in the conflict comply fully with international humanitarian law, the UN Charter, and the many relevant United Nations resolutions, including Resolution 2334 of 2016. As an occupying power, the Israeli government has a responsibility to protect the civilian population, guarantee complete, unhindered, and secure access for humanitarian assistance to the vulnerable, that is the elderly, women, and children, and also facilitate the free movement of humanitarian workers throughout the occupied territories. Mr. President, in concluding, we affirm our position that violence cannot be a tool for the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and that the path for lasting peace and stability in the Middle East runs through the internationally negotiated two-state solution, with Israel and Palestine living side by side on the basis of the pre-1967 borders. The realization of the goals of the Middle East process, however, require the Council and the wider international community to sustain the engagement of the parties whose good faith efforts are required to resolve this decades-long conflict. I thank you. I thank the representative of Ghana. I now give the floor to the representative of Norway. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Special Coordinator Venneslan, for your timely briefing. We also appreciate the contributions of Commissioner General Lazzarini and Mr. Levy. First, let me acknowledge and again thank the Special Coordinator and the UN for all their efforts to establish a ceasefire following the latest hostilities in Gaza. We would also like to highlight the critical roles of Egypt and Qatar. It's now essential that the ceasefire continues to be respected and economic measures and the easing of restrictions on access and movement continue. President, 17 children were killed and hundreds injured in Gaza during the hostilities earlier this month. These escalations have consequences. And we condemn all indiscriminate uh, attacks and attacks against civilians. All parties are obliged to protect civilians and fully respect international humanitarian law, including its principles of distinction, proportionality and precaution. Furthermore, Norway strongly condemns all acts of terror, including the attack on Israeli civilians in Jerusalem on August 14, where eight people were injured. Everyone, Israelis and Palestinians, deserve to live in security. There is an urgent need for a more long-term solution, including a political horizon. President, turning to other relevant developments, we are deeply concerned about shrinking space for civil society, including the recent Israeli raids against several Palestinian civil society organizations in Area A in Ramallah. And we are troubled by subsequent reports of threats against the employees of these organizations and their families. Such actions are unacceptable. These organizations carry out important work defending the human rights of Palestinians vis-a-vis -vis both the Israeli and Palestinian authorities. 
they must be allowed to continue to work in a safe and enabling environment. Norway has clearly stated that the information Israel has provided does not sufficiently justify designating the organizations as terror organizations. We will continue our support for Palestinian civil society. A strong and vibrant civil society is key to promoting democracy, human rights in Palestine, and supporting the two-state solution. President Norway will convene the AHLC ministerial meeting, the donor group for Palestine, in the margins of the General Assembly on 22 September. The aim of the AHLC is to help build the foundations for the Palestinian state. Items on the agenda include further strengthening the PA's institutions and PA reform, increasing the PA's revenues, transferring more authority from Israel to the PA, developing infrastructure and easing restrictions on travel, trade and economic activity both in the West Bank and Gaza. This work must also include Palestinian leaders contributing to strengthening the legitimacy and accountability of the PA. We urge the parties to use this opportunity and step up their efforts to make progress in the state building agenda. President, as Commissioner General Lazzarini has outlined, UNRWA plays a key role in ensuring that the needs Palestinian refugees are met, that the needs of Palestinian refugees are met and that their rights are ensured. The agency's continued ability to serve this function also remains crucial for regional stability. We're deeply concerned by the warnings of yet another financing crisis in the autumn, once again putting the agency's service delivery at risk. The recurrent budget crisis have a detrimental effect on the agency, its staff and the Palestinian refugee population in general. We call for renewed efforts to mobilize resources, to provide flexible financing and to put the agency on a more stable financial footing. President, in closing, let me repeat our call for increased efforts to prepare for negotiations towards a political settlement. The two-state solution, based on the 1967 lines, is the only viable solution to ensure peace and security for both Israelis and Palestinians. I thank you. I thank the representative of Norway. I now give the floor to the representative of Ireland. Hello to Special Coordinator Venisland and to Commissioner Lazzarini for your very helpful briefings. And Daniel, it is very good to see you back in New York and thank you so much for your incisive insights. I think it has given us a lot of food for thought, so thank you for that. Today I wanted to focus on three issues, the protection of civilians, the issue of accountability and the critical issue of civil society space for Palestinian civil society. Ireland welcomes that the ceasefire agreed on 7 August between Israel and Palestinian Islamic Jihad continues to hold. We also welcome the lifting of additional restrictions imposed on 2 August on the crossings into the Gaza Strip. Nonetheless, we share concerns about the fragility of the ceasefire and the potential for another major escalation, particularly as tensions remain high in the West Bank. President, in all conflict, protection of civilians must be paramount. As a result of the hostilities this month, 49 Palestinians were killed, including 17 children in the Gaza Strip. It is appalling that once again, we must address the killing of innocent children in this council today. International humanitarian law is clear. Any attack must comply with the principles of distinction, proportionality and precautions. All civilians in Gaza, the West Bank and Israel must be protected. We know what is needed to protect civilians in Gaza, a permanent ceasefire and the lifting of the blockade in line with Resolution 1860 of this Council. People in Gaza have nowhere to go. The most recent escalation has exacerbated the already severe humanitarian crisis in the Gaza Strip. As we have heard from UNRWA and others, humanitarian actors are providing essential supports in Gaza. Continued support for UNRWA, which we have just heard from the Commissioner General, is so vital for all Palestine refugees, and it is absolutely essential. 
Mr. President, Ireland is gravely concerned at the alarming increase in Palestinian civilian fatalities, including the killing and maiming of children in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, as a result of the use of live ammunition by Israeli forces. We call on Israel to refrain from using excessive force and for impartial and transparent investigations into all incidents that led to death or injury. Those responsible for our violations must be held accountable. Ireland condemns the gun attack on a bus carrying Jewish worshippers in Jerusalem on 14 August that led to the injury of eight civilians. So long as there is an absence of accountability and the root causes of the conflict remain unaddressed, cycles of conflict and violence throughout the occupied Palestinian territory and Israel will continue. Ireland is also concerned by Israel's extensive use of administrative detention, which is now at its highest level since 2008. Ireland calls on Israel to act in accordance with its obligations under international human rights and humanitarian law, and in particular to refrain from arbitrary arrests and detention. Mr. President, the Israeli raids on six Palestinian civil society organizations on 18 August and the measures which have followed are unacceptable and represent a worrying reduction of space for civil society in the OPT. In common with others, we have not received any information from Israel that would justify reviewing our policy towards these NGOs. Ireland supports the UN High Commissioner's call on Israel to revoke the designations against Palestinian civil society organizations as terrorist entities. We have serious concerns about the misuse of counter-terror legislation to reduce civil society space in the occupied Palestinian territory. Israeli incursions into Area A undermine previously signed agreements and the prospects for a two-state solution. Mr. President, Ireland's view on Israeli settlement activity and practice of evictions and demolitions have been clearly stated in this council before. Any settlement activity and advancement by Israel in the E1 area in particular would undermine the viability and territorial contiguity of a future Palestinian state and jeopardize the two-state solution. We urge Israel not to proceed with its eviction decision in Masafriyata and its planned demolition of donor-funded school in Ain Samia. And finally, Mr. President, Ireland would like to reiterate the need to restore hope for a political horizon and a meaningful peace process towards a two-state solution based on the 1967 lines with Jerusalem as the shared capital of both states. Ireland reaffirms the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. It is incumbent on the parties and on this council, together with the wider international community, to revive direct and inclusive engagement so that all Israelis and Palestinians can live in peace. Thank you. I thank the representative of Ireland. Now give the floor to the representative of India. President, grateful to Tor Wensland, General Philippe Lazzarini and Daniel Levy for their briefings. Thank you for that. The escalation of hostilities earlier this month in the Gaza Strip has only exacerbated the dire humanitarian situation of the Gazan Palestinians who have already been suffering, including due to the non-availability of funds for the UN Humanitarian Response Plan and the global increase in commodity prices. We hope that the situation will be addressed soon with increased donor funding. We welcome the ceasefire in the Gaza Strip. We urge the parties to abide by the ceasefire agreement strictly so that the ongoing intensive diplomatic efforts can strengthen them. In this context, we appreciate the efforts of the international community, especially the role of Egypt in the process. We also note Israel's efforts to resume the movement of people from the Gaza Strip and the entry of humanitarian goods and fuel following the ceasefire. While we are focusing on strengthening the ceasefire, we must also continue to work together towards a political solution to effectively address the underlying drivers of the dire economic and humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip. Mr. President, we remain deeply co concerned by the developments in the West Bank and Jerusalem. Violent attacks and the killing of civilians have continued during the reporting period. Acts of destruction and demolition are also continuing. Provocative action and rhetoric have again raised tensions around Jerusalem's holy sites. The historical and legal status quo at Jerusalem's holy places must be respected and upheld. We are also gravely concerned 
about the acts of terror and incidents of violence in Israel and the West Bank. There can be no justification for any act of violence committed against civilians. We have consistently advocated against all acts of violence, especially against women and children, and we reiterate our call for a complete cessation of violence. We urge parties to refrain from unilateral measures that vitiate conditions necessary for promoting peace and instead focus on bridging the trust deficit. It is the international community's collective responsibility to send a strong signal against any step preventing the possibility of a two-state solution. Mr. President, UNRWA's financial challenges are compounding every year. There is a significant risk of curtailment of UNRWA services if adequate funds are unavailable soon. The agency's services to millions of Palestinian refugees are crucial from the humanitarian and development perspective and contribute to overall stability in the region. As far as India is concerned and responding to UNRWA's funding crisis, we have increased our annual financial contribution to UNRWA. Since 2018, we have contributed US dollars 20 million to the agency's program budget. We have also pledged US dollars 5 million for this year, half of which has already been released. We encourage donors to consider stepping up their contribution so as to help the agency overcome its liquidity crisis this year. Mr. President, the situation again underscores the need for the immediate resumption of peace talks between Israel and Palestine. The absence of such direct negotiations is not conducive to securing long-term peace and will only increase the risk of recurrence and escalation of violence in Israel and Palestine. Therefore, an immediate necessity is an early return to the political dialogue process by launching credible direct negotiations. India has consistently called for direct peace negotiations between Israel and Palestine towards a two-state solution, taking into account the legitimate aspirations of the Palestinian people for statehood and Israel's legitimate security concerns. The UN and the international community must prioritize the resumption of these negotiations. In conclusion, Mr. President, I reaffirm India's unwavering commitment to establishing a sovereign, independent, and viable state of Palestine, living within secure and recognized borders side by side at peace with Israel, taking into account Israel's legitimate security concerns. There is no other alternative to a negotiated two-state solution. Thank you. I thank the representative of India for the statement. I shall now make a statement in my capacity as the representative of China. I thank Special Coordinator Wenis Land, Commissioner General Lazzarini, and Mr. Levy for their briefings. Their views and recommendations have served as useful inspiration for the work of the Security Council. For the past months, the volatile situation in the occupied Palestinian territories has been stirring the nerves of the whole world. The conflict in Gaza have led to the hundreds of civilian casualties and massive damage to the infrastructure, once again pushing the situation to the brink of war and plunging the people of Gaza into fear and a life in dire straits. We appreciate the active mediation by Egypt, Qatar, Jordan, and other regional countries, and Special Coordinator Wenesland for reaching a ceasefire. It is imperative to promote the effective observance of the ceasefire by all parties and exercise of restraint so that the situation in Gaza will promptly and fully return to calm. Diplomatic efforts on all fronts should continue. During the conflict, the UN Relief and Works Agency for the Palestinian Refugees in the Near East and other humanitarian agencies have overcome many difficulties, actively carried out humanitarian operations, and provided the people in Gaza with emergency relief and aid. China highly appreciates this. The path of recovery and reconstruction of Gaza is a tortuous and long one. The international community should accelerate its humanitarian response offer assistance to Palestine through multiple channels, and provide strong support for UNRWA. 
we call on Israel to facilitate the entry of humanitarian and reconstruction supplies into Gaza and to promptly and fully lift its blockade on Gaza. Frequent incidents of violence on the West Bank are a cause for concern. China condemns all indiscriminate attacks on civilians in the OPT and the grave violations against children, opposes the excessive use of force by the ISF and calls for investigations into and accountability for those incidents of violence. Over a hundred days have passed since female journalist Akli from Al Jazeera was shot dead, yet there is still no credible explanation for the cause of the incident. For years, the civil society organizations of Palestine have played a vital role in helping vulnerable populations, including women and children, improving the humanitarian situation in the OPT, and upholding legitimate rights of the Palestinian people. The recent actions by Israel against multiple Palestinian CSOs have caused widespread worries among the international community. We call on Israel to earnestly respond to the concerns of the international community. Colleagues, the status quo in the OPT is not sustainable. The international community must rise above piecemeal crisis management, face squarely the root causes, take effective actions, and promote an early return of the settlement of the Palestinian question to the right track. First, encourage Palestine and Israel to pursue common security. Israel and Palestine are and will remain neighbors. Their security is interdependent and indivisible. Seeking absolute security of one side, taking unilateral actions, and basing one's own security on the insecurity of the other will only aggravate mistrust, heighten tensions, and trap them in an endless cycle of violence. The international community should attach equal importance to the security concerns of both Palestine and Israel and encourage both sides to find the greatest common denominator through dialogue and cooperation to achieve common security. At the same time, the occupying power should effectively fulfill its obligations under international law to protect the safety of the people in the occupied territories. Second, promptly reverse the negative trends on the ground. The continued expansion of settlement activities encroaches upon Palestinian land, swallows up Palestinian resources, and violates Palestine's right to self-determination, making a contiguous, independent, and sovereign state of Palestine more out of reach with each passing day. Every inch of settlement expansion adds a new obstacle for the two-state solution. We call for immediate cessation of all settlement activities, the stopping of unilateral changes to the status quo in the OPT, and demarcating the final borders between Palestine and Israel through peaceful negotiations. Third, advance the two-state solution on all fronts. The Palestinian question has been dragging on for over 70 years. Generations of Palestinian refugees have lost their homes and suffered from displacement, and countless Palestinian children have been deprived of hope and a future. What is lacking in the settlement of the Palestinian question are not grand plans or loud slogans, but the courage to stand up for justice and actions to fulfill commitments. Whether the UN and the Security Council are responsible and dare to act is being followed by the international community and recorded by history. It is imperative to muster a sense of urgency, take substantive steps to advance the two-state solution, and support the Palestinian people in restoring and exercising their inalienable rights so as to fundamentally realize the peaceful coexistence of Palestine and Israel, the harmonious coexistence between the Arab and Jewish nations, and lasting peace in the Middle East. Thank you. I now resume 
my function as president of the council. There are no more names inscribed on the list of speakers. The meeting is adjourned.